Good Thursday morning. We go from, again, it's Isaiah. I just, maybe I'm, st I'm really focused because he's a great writing, okay? And he's trying through various forms of imagery, okay, to capture the redemptive love of God for people who have suffered and been in one way rejected, even by God, in a pun not a punitive way, in a redemptive way. When God punishes, he doesn't punish to restore justice in a sense of getting even. He seeks to make justice, which is to make things right. So he calls the sinner back, the forlorn. He brings back. It is not a case of punishment and diminishment unless you choose it. The will of God is to redeem all, to bring us to himself. Not to, to cause death, but to bring about life, even if it is through death. That's Christ on the cross, you see. So watch what he says. He uses here, it's a different image. It's, now he's, he's obviously talking to the people of Israel. He sees them as a, as a wife who has been abandoned, okay? And, she, and he's calling, the wife is being called back. See? Watch what he says. Raise a glad cry, you barren one who did not bear. Break forth in jubilant song, you who are not in labor. For more numerous are the children of the deserted wife than the children of her who has a husband, says the Lord. Enlarge the space for your tent. Spread out your tent cloths unsparingly. Lengthen your robes and make firm your stakes. For you shall spread abroad to the right and to the left. Your descendants shall dispossess the nations and shall people and shall people the desolate cities. You're going to flourish, you see. It's his promise, God's promise. Who's he talking to? The Israelites, you see. Fear not, you, you shall not be put to shame. You need not blush, for you shall not be disgraced. The shame of your youth you shall forget. Isn't that a great line? The reproach of your widowhood no longer remember. For he who has become your husband is your maker. His name is the Lord of hosts. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, called the God of all the earth. The Lord calls you back, like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit, a wife married in youth and in cast off, says your God. For a brief moment I abandoned you, but with great tenderness I will take you back. In an outburst of wrath, for a moment, I hid my face from you. But with enduring love, I take pity on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. This is for me like the days of Noah, when I swore that the waters of Noah should never again deluge the earth. So I have sworn not to be angry with you or to rebuke you. Though the mountains leave their place and the hills be forsaken, shaken, my love shall never leave you, nor my covenant of peace be shaken says the Lord who has mercy on you. Boy, that's a great line, isn't it? No matter what, God is always faithful to us, and it's always a God of loving mercy, a God who makes all that which is fractured, even though we're the ones who made the fracture. I take great solace in that, because as you get older, for those of you watching these things, and if you're old like me, you know that, that your life was not an innocent life, a life of innocence. But but a, a life of both fidelity and infidelity, a, a life as much of moments of failure as moments of success, moments of love and even moments of betrayal, sometimes the betrayal only of the heart, of insensitivity to the spouse, callousness or selfishness with regard to one's children, whatever, I don't know. For me, my ministry, my vocation, this, none of us are clean. <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. We're always like this forsaken wife, in a sense, always forsaken by our own fault in this case, okay? That's what our Lord's saying. But he's calling us back out of love. Even if we were unfaithful, he is faithful. And if he punishes us, it's only to call us back to redemption. It's to shake us out of our complacency. In some senses, I... I don't know, it's almost blasphemous what I'm saying, but I don't mean it as blasphemy. It's just sometimes, why do the, why do the tax collectors and why do the, you know, the prostitutes turn to Christ? It's because they recognize their own sinfulness. And they are sinful. They are the betrayers. But they recognize it. And that's the, open, that's the thing that opens us to redemption, is the recognition of our sinfulness. You know, when the saints cry out how sinful they are and yet they come across as as innocent and clean as you can get, they're actually telling you the truth. The truest thing about them is not their piety. 
is their sense of the need for redemption. I mean that, too. I mean it. I, mean, I, I don't want to beat this thing to death, but innocence has no cash value when it comes to redemption. In fact, the worst thing is the sense of one's own innocence. I, I always like to make fun of it. I, I, I'm always imitating the male. I can't help it. You know what I mean? I keep my nose clean. I keep my mouth shut. I don't know what anybody's complaining about. You know? I didn't do nothing. The question is, did you do something? When did you do the right thing? Not that you did the wrong thing, but when did you do the right thing? That's what I mean by active fidelity. You can live a completely so-called innocent, non, non-sinful, apparently sinful life and, and still fail. And why you failed is because you didn't do the good you should have done. You just, you just kept your nose clean. The Israelites could never make that claim. Their foot was in it all the way, and that was, makes them so beautiful. They were always in need of redemption, and they knew it. See, they knew it, and the prophets called them to it. Grant you, they resisted the prophets too, but the point is they also heard them. To some degree, they heard the prophetic voice. And I think that's important. I think it's crucial that we have a conscience sensitive to the reality of our lives and what we are called to be. Now, innocence, especially canonical innocence, keeping rules, but the fidelity to the life we have been called to live by our vocations. We are called by God. That's vocatio. We are called by God to make a difference. And for most of us, and if not all of us, the lives of each other, what difference do we make in the people's lives who are given to us by God? For most of you, it's your spouse and your children and your grandchildren. For me, it's the people that God gave me too, the people in my life who would be principally my family and my friends, my fellow passionists, but the kids in my class. What difference did I make? to these kids in class or I just picking up a paycheck? Do I care about them? See, beyond the obvious, not just fulfilling my contract, but do I love them? I remember once we were giving a, a this was 50 years ago, we, we were being trained to give homilies, give sermons, okay? And we were going to these practice homilies, okay? And I was very righteous. And Father Cash in Newhouse, a great passionist, he raised his hand at the end of it. And he said, hey, Dad. I said, what? Do you love us? I said, yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, Cash, you know I do. Then talk to us like you love us. Quit yelling at us. <laughs> yeah, I never forgot that line. I hope I've never yelled at anybody since. Keep your righteousness. We are, the, we are, the, we are called as sinners, the clergy, the leadership of the mouthpieces of the church. We've been called insofar as we are weak and sinful to be the mouthpiece of God. We are, we are no different than those to whom we preach. We are themse- ourselves in need of redemption and we share that need with each other in the f- hope and trust in the fidelity of God and his mercy. We are first and foremost sinners called to do something noble, S- to, be mouth- to be the voice of Ocho de Dio, the voice of God in the world whether from the hierarchy to the structure, the rest, I put all the rest in need of our own redemption. We're no better than those to whom we preach. And the recognition of that, that was what Cashin said when he raised his hand, Dad, do you love us? They quit yelling at us, but rather talk with us. In the intimacy of fellow companions on the journey across the Sinai Desert with the leadership of Moses Christ, okay? See? and encouraging one another and often getting out of line but getting straightened out later. We are always in need of redemption. And we preach a crucified Christ, which is a love, Christ's love for us, and which is a redemptive, forgiving love. And we need the forgiveness, and we desperately need the love.